So let's talk about the many major things that rangelands are used for. There are many uh, uses for which uh, lands can be used sustainably. But what's interesting is not only should they be used sustainably, but they should be used simultaneously. In other words, rangelands are useful for a lot of resources, and it would be, I think, uh, not right or, or not a good type of management if they were used for only one. So livestock production, recreation, water, sustainable energy, minerals, mining, uh, open space, wildlife habitat, forage, quality for both wildlife and livestock, and then native plants are, are some of the major ones that we'll talk about today. But that term multiple use is definitely important because it describes uh, the way that what you consider the the multiple and sustainable use of many of these values. And it's important to avoid overuse or the destruction of these natural resources. The Society for Range Management um, harkens to this idea when they say that it's the harmonious use of native rangelands that is more than one purpose, such as more than one purpose, such as livestock, recreation, water, wildlife. So that this concept of being able to use many resources at the same time is at the heart of uh, land management, and it is probably not appropriate to uh, use for one resource without considering other resources on the land. So let's start this discussion then uh, by starting with livestock production as one of the major uses of, of rangelands. So let's start with livestock production. It's certainly one of the most uh, well-recognized resources that can be used and produced on rangelands. Um, often it was, historically, it was the one thing that rangelands could be used for to you know, settle the West and create economic value of these lands. Dr. Nathan Sayer, in his book on the history of range science, goes so far to, to define rangelands as the non-forested places where intensive economic activities have not yet taken root. So those areas that could not be plowed to produce crops, could not, uh, did not have trees to produce timber, they could be great. So livestock production uh, is a very important uh, economic revenue source on rangelands. Uh, livestock grazing occurs on about 65% of Idaho, for example. That's uh, nearly all of the uh, rangelands, plus some of gr some grazed timberlands to create about 65% of Idaho's land that is grazed. In fact, there's grazing in every county of the state. So range production is one of the really leading agricultural industries in Idaho, second only to dairy as a, a, as a way to, you know, put economic income into rural communities. It's important for ranchers, but also for meat producers, for um, plant workers, delivery trucks, uh, restaurant operators, managers of supermarkets, and all of that needed to get uh, this product to the consumer. So that really adds revenue and economic engine to rural communities. So how many livestock are there out there? Well, um, in Idaho, there's about uh, 2.35 million head of cattle and calves as of January 1, 2017. Uh, to put that in perspective, uh, neighboring states like Oregon has 1.32 million head and Washington 1.15. So we've got about uh, the same amount of cattle as both Oregon and Washington combined. But the big livestock producers in the West would be states like Texas, which have about 12 million cattle and calves. Or in the plains, states like Nebraska have over 6 million, about 6.5 million cattle. So those are the kinds of, of numbers just to help you put those in perspective. So rangelands and pasture lands throughout the West are home to about 58% of all beef cattle in the U.S., 79% uh, of the sheep, and about 88% of the goats that are raised in the, in the United States. Well, beyond livestock, rangelands are also important for a whole host of other critters. So wildlife habitat on rangelands is provides a home and, and fo forage resources for countless mammals, birds, amphibians, fishes, and insects. Wildlife provide uh, ecological benefits. They're part of the important ecosystem and a healthy rangeland ecosystem, but they're also um, important for economic values, such as animal pr uh, products like uh, meat and venison, uh, but also sportsmen's activities and aesthetic values. So they have both economic, ecological, and social values. Um, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, in some information that I, I read quite a while ago, said that livestock provide habitat for countless mammals, fish, amphibians, and insects. And they estimated the numbers uh, that animals in the U.S. need or use rangelands 
uh, for part of their life. So about 84% of mammals use rangelands at least part of their life, 74% of birds, 58% of amphibians, and 38% of fish can be found in these ecosystems. So they're an important, intricate part of many wildlife species in North America. We're going to talk about wildlife uh, and we're going to think a little bit about what their role is, especially in using the forage or food resources. In order to think about food resources, we could categorize wildlife into a few broad carries, categories depending on their digestive system. Of course, one really important group of uh, animals and wildlife on rangelands are ruminants, such as these pronghorn. Uh, they have uh, a, a four-parted stomach, which you probably know um, is important to help animals break down cell walls and use rangeland plants for energies, energy. So on rangeland, that would include deer, elk, moose, uh, pronghorn, and all those large ungulates. Other important herbivores on rangelands are uh, rodents and rabbits. They also have a digestive system that allows them to uh, digest uh, cellulose. Concentrate selectors are animals that um, use only the very highest quality forage, uh, forage that does not have a cellulose or hemicellulose in it. So concentrate selectors would be things like carnivores, which use uh, which eat other animals, or it would be animals like um, like this sage grouse here, which eats seeds and insects and really high quality forages. Uh, water is also a really important resource on rangelands. We don't get a lot of moisture, so what moisture we get is really important that we conserve it and we use it in, in a productive way. Um, most of the rangeland that, that hits the forested or high elevation lands on rangelands is, is really what goes into the creeks and then ends up in canals and really um, charges the water supply for agriculture industry and domestic or, or uses by cities and towns. So it's that higher elevation water that's really important, but it, it moves through rangelands. And even though we don't get a, water, a lot of water, what, what little moisture we get is really important. Um, one of the main questions we ask as range managers is how can we improve water retention? So what can we do by managing the, the vegetation and understanding the soil to really lead to keeping that water on the land for a longer time and getting it to recharge and, and move through the soil profile and recharge the water table? So that's what our job as range managers are, is to manage that hydrologic cycle by managing vegetation. So that is important because through our management actions, we can sustain the water quality and quantity available to humans and other animals in the ecosystem. Rangelands are increasingly important for recreational uses. And in fact, many uh, famous national parks, you know, iconic national parks are found on, on rangelands. The ones in uh, Utah, for example, Arches National Park, Bryce National Park, all of those, the, the Grand Canyon and others are all rangeland essentially. And they're important for hiking and hunting and camping and mountain biking and cross country skiing and snowmobiling and all sorts of uses. Um, every few years, the USDA National Survey on Recreation and the Environment is conducted, and they track trends uh, on demand for specific recreational uses on public lands across the U.S. So let's take a look at some of the changes uh, on recreation that has happened in this 27-year period between 1982 and 2009. So think a little bit about these uses of rangelands, hiking, driving off roads, fishing and hunting, and then viewing and photographing birds. How have they changed over the years? Well, let's uh, take a look at day hiking, for example. That's one that has increased radically in the last 27 years. Uh, actually doubled, a 210% increase in hiking. What about driving off roads? That has also increased, probably because uh, ATVs and uh, off-road vehicles have really become a lot more useful and a lot more uh, you know, safe and available. So uh, increased use of off-road uh, vehicle use. What about hunting and fishing? That's the one where it's about 30% of what it was 27 years ago. So the percentage of uh, a, a percent change is that it, it is de decreasing um, from what it was uh, 30, 27 years ago. Uh, so the last one is just using the lands and, and, and looking at birds and other wildlife is also an increasing use. And I think that's probably because as we become a more urbanized society, it's really much more important to go out and see nature. So that is one that's a real increasing use on rangelands. 
Okay, while that's true that we looked at some trends that are increasing and decreasing, these are the actual numbers uh, from that same survey. This is the actual numbers of individuals that used, uh, that engaged in these different um, recreational activities. And, and I guess what I want to point out right here is that uh, hunting and fishing, although it has decreased, is still the dominant use on rangelands, still really important in terms of the number of people that engage in that activity. Renewable energy is uh, also a growing resource on rangelands. They are, uh, it's a dominant and major use of western rangelands and it re represents a significant source of alternative energy to uh, the western uh, populations and to the whole U.S. The energy is essentially uh, a sustainable de development form. So it, although it's really uh, important, it's sustainable, and many people like that idea, it's not without controversy. When people look out at vistas like this and they see it interrupted by these large wind turbines, or more and more commonly by these uh, reflective um, solar energy sources, uh, that can be that can gain some controversy. Let's take a little cl closer look at that. If you think about wind, wind energy accounts for about 6% of the renewable electric generated in the U.S. So it's not a, a large number, but it's one that is, is found only on rangelands. So it's one value that rangelands have that it can't, uh, these wind turbines really can't be put in cities or in forests. To some degree, they can be put on, on crop, crop systems. Uh, we also need really large open tracts of land with higher high sunlight high s solar radiation to create um, the opportunity for capturing solar energy such as we have this um, solar array uh, in the the slide here so that happens a lot in the southwest geothermal energy you know taking uh, the heat from that is produced and captured as water down uh, under the uh, under the surface of the earth is important in, in 12 western states including alaska and in fact idaho where we live uh, here is also has several geothermal resources in fact our capital is is heated by geothermal energy so it's important to about 1.2 million um, homes in the west and often used for heating energy by biomass and bioenergy are important sources of, of renewable energy, not not so much in Idaho. They're they're more important when you have lo lots of uh, like I'm sorry, they're not so important on rangelands. Often biomass and bioenergy are more important in places that can produce a lot of biomass, such as croplands and forests. But they do have um, an important role to play on rangelands. Mineral and mining is also a resource on rangelands that is full of controversy. It's certainly historic. Uh, most of the restoration programs that throughout the West are, are seated in range programs because we're the one, we're the um, discipline that comes in after mining and and does restoration, and it is an important resource on rangelands. So uh, some of the most basic natural resources um, that we need are found on rangelands: sand, gravel, dirt rocks and basic materials for construction. In fact, there's quite a bit of interest right now that, that the amount of sand on earth is actually limited. You wouldn't think of it, but we're, we're pouring so much cement and one of the really important um, elements of cement is sand and they're actually running out of sand in places. So we might see more uh, sand uh, harvesting, uh, although it is mostly sand in, from the ocean that, that goes through that rounding that is more valuable, but still sand is an important resource that might come off of rangelands. Coal and oil shale mining has been used for uh, decades to heat and power society. Oil and shale production is having a huge impact on rangelands in North Dakota, Montana, and Wyoming. And also Texas, we, we think about uh, a lot of oil production and being important on rangelands. And the role that we as a rangeland professionals play is, is mostly in restoration. There's also a wide array of uh, not only sand, gravel, and rock, not only coal and oil shale, but also think about um, some states such as Idaho where gold, silver, zinc, cobalt, phosphate, and other, uh, other minerals are important uh, at, at, for society and for mining on rangelands. Another growing interest in rangelands is the value of native plant products. Now, historically, they were always important. They were the natural foods and medicines that uh, pioneers used, that Native Americans used, and still are used today. 
Uh, so think about some of those natural products. Like uh, maybe you've even used echinacea when you get sick in the winter. That oftentimes you can get uh, echinacea tea or pills that are you know supposed to really help you get over that cold. St. John's wort is also an important medicine that is available over the counter now. But both St. John's wort and echinacea, echinacea is the picture here on the left, they were both native uh, plants that, that somebody found a value for, and they still grow out in the wild. In the middle there is a picture of... Uh, um, Western yarrow. And yarrow is important because it's really widespread across the West and it's a really important antimicrobial agent. And if you're out camping, it's one that you would take those leaves if you crush them in your hand, it would clean your hands off so that you could eat dinner or do whatever. It would just like taking one of those antimicrobial wipes. It does the same thing. And it's also important if you get a bee sting or a cut or something that you can use that uh, for to, you know, to clean the wound. So that's one that we find all the way across rangelands is a really important medicinal value. And also thinking about food such as camas, the camas prairie, the camas root, biscuit root is an important um, native pro product that can be dried and used. Uh, also in this picture on the top are berries such as choke cherry. That's a picture of choke cherry. So pine nuts would be another one. There's a lot of things that we can eat. There's a lot of medicines that we can use on rangelands. What's interesting is that these native plants are really uh, growing in interest. Uh, people are looking more and more for native seeds, um, not only na the native products above, but also for native seeds used in rangeland restoration. So I think there's a growing value in people understanding native plants and using them uh, as a resource on rangelands. Here's an interesting resource, open space. I was once kidded by one of my friends when I was growing up that I grew up on the plains on the prairie and you could see for miles and miles and I said that it was a beautiful place. He said, well, it's not the end of the earth, but you can see it from there. Okay, so we range people have to put up with a lot of chiding from people that can't look down and see the vast beauty of rangelands because if you're driving by at a, at a high rate, you just don't see what's out there. You just see this landscape that's wide and open. Okay, it's kind of a new resource because it's unlikely that the pioneers that were trying to turn this open space into useful fields and trying to make a living out on the range, they probably didn't value the open space. In fact, oftentimes they much preferred just be, you know, meeting with people because they were alone and out on the landscape so often. But now as populations become more urbanized, that open space is becoming more and more valuable because we can see people all the time. We can see um, cities, we can see buildings. What we miss is that landscapes that are just wide where you can't see anything to the horizon. So uh, that, that's a new value of, of open space. Livestock ranchers um, are, are very important for that open space in what is called like working wilderness. It's a ranch, so it's working, but in a way it's kind of a wilderness because that, that by producing cattle you can still have those vast open landscapes to maintain biodiversity and wildlife habitat. Interesting too that it's so important that um, people, conservationists, environmentally concerned citizens uh, actually provide money to pay for that open space through scenic easements. So they essentially buy an easement from someone who owns land uh, and the, what they're paying for is the, the promise that that person will never, uh, pro will never divide the land and put s towns or, or cities or roads on it. So that's called the scenic easement. And those are becoming more and more important out the West as we're trying to maintain that open space. This one you can't really sell, but I think it's really important, this, this resource of Western heritage. Uh, many of us move to the West. It's, it's the Western way of life. It's something we love about this land. It's, it's the Western image. It's our brand as Westerners. It's also really important as a legacy and heritage for um, not only pioneers, but Native American tribes that have been here for centuries, uh, knowing this land. And so that the heritage that Native Americans have in the land, that's all part of our Western tradition. So I've mentioned multiple uses, and, and I started out this whole presentation saying that that was very important that we use uh, lands um, you know, simultaneously and in concert, some uses uh, um, together without causing any damage to the land. But certainly all of us have some things that we think are more appropriate on rangelands than others. We all have sort of our favorite use of rangeland. 
And the Social Science Research Unit here at the University of Idaho was contracted by the Idaho Rangeland Resource Commission a few years ago to see what people in Idaho think are appropriate uses of rangeland. And here's just one graph out of their survey. So if you look at the blue graphs, blue bars on this graph, that, that would be uh, where people said that, yes, this was an appropriate use. And, and red is where they said no, and gray is where they weren't sure. So some things are kind of interesting like that. Certainly most people think that mountain biking, hiking, camping are pr completely um, useful or appropriate uses of, of, of federal land. Not so much ATVs and motorized vehicles. We said those are becoming more popular on land, but not everyone likes it. So some people really think that's not an appropriate use. Energy development and transmission lines, again, many people thought that was not appropriate. Hunting, fishing, most people think that's great. Guided recreation, still a lot of support for guided recreation on public lands. At least in this survey, logging a little bit, uh, as more than 65% said logging was an appropriate use of federal lands, uh, and about 20% said it wasn't. Uh, many people, if you asked them if grazing was okay, a lot of people think that society thinks grazing is not okay on federal lands. But in this survey, over 85%, about 90% of people in Idaho said livestock grazing was a perfectly appropriate use of federal lands. So what you read in the paper may not always be what society in, in general uh, feels is an appropriate use. So in the one of the activities we've had in class, we've asked you what your personal uh, thoughts are on any of these uses on rangelands, and, um, and and then we, we could ask society what they think of those uses. Another way to look at rangeland values is to think of them in the context of ecological services. Ecological services are just the benefits that society gains from nature. So the things that nature does that provides life on earth. Those ecosystem services are broadly um, classified in four different categories supporting, provisioning, regulating, and cultural. So supporting services are those things like soil formation, primary production, that's where plants take energy from the sun and turn it into some form of energy that we can use, habitat uh, in terms of uh, hiding or cover habitat for animals, and biodiversity. Those kinds of things are how nature works to kind of support society on earth. Um, others are provisioning services. We, that's mostly what we've talked about in this discussion are things like food and fiber, uh, clean water, the, the medicinal or the, um, the food value of native plants. Those would all be provisioning. Uh, others are regulating. Uh, when plants take in carbon, that changes the carbon in the atmosphere and it changes the climate. A some insects, such as this picture here, are pollinating crops. Other insects are controlling weeds in crops or on rangeland. So that's a regulating service. Uh, of course, uh, plants store carbon in their roots and plants control flooding because they, they um, promote the infiltration into, of water into the earth, etc. Those are all regulating services. And finally, the one that seems hardest to describe is those cultural services. When you're out in nature and you're inspired or you're out recreating or even when we go out on field trips and we educate each other about nature or, or maybe it's just aesthetic maybe you just want to be out there and look at the landscape those would be cultural services one of the things that uh, to keep in mind is not all of these cost or provide money so for a long time we've thought about rangelands as um, how much beef can it produce or how much energy can it produce uh, in wind turbines or others, but a lot of these services are really important and they're growing in importance, but they don't have a, a monetary value. So one of the challenges that uh, rangeland managers and ecosystem scientists are working with right now is how do you give value to these things that are hard to put a dollar value on? So what is the price of climate regulation or pollination, for example? Many people are beneficiaries of these ecological services that we described. And by beneficiaries, I mean those who live on the land and produce livestock, so they, they might produce uh, resources that are of value. The, the, also those who visit land for hunting or recreation, uh, those who manage land, such as agencies and organizations, and then those who just care about rangelands in general. All of those would be beneficiaries of rangelands and, and even people who don't even know rangelands exist can benefit from uh, some ecological services. 
Think about that. Some services are really local, like um, insects that or birds that are pollinating plants. That that one small population of insects as, and small population of plants are very local. There's cultural services that are local, such as scenic vistas, like in this picture. There's a picture of someone camping out on rangeland out in the Great Basin, and it's a beautiful picture. That person is getting the value of that scenic vista, and someone in Europe or Australia can't benefit from that one vista unless they come visit. Food and fiber can be very local. A producer, a, a rancher can produce livestock on their ranch and eat those livestock. Um, they can um, hunt uh, wildlife on their land and, and get the food and fiber from those wildlife. Um, or some resources are global. For example, some of the food that that person or family produces could be a global resource. They could sell livestock and it could be transported across the globe to people in Africa or Australia or Europe. So some are very local and other resources are global. A good example of a global resource would be sequestration of, sequestration of, of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. That benefits all of society, even though it might happen in one local place. Air purification, water purification, uh, that might happen on a ranch or on a management area, but that water is going to go to the ocean eventually or into the atmosphere. Species preservation also. I, I've never visited Africa, but there are species in Africa that I feel are important to preserve. So that's a global resource. When we manage wildlife, people that are never seeing those wildlife species may care about them for that biodiversity preservation concept. Now, you might have seen this coming. Different people have different uh, demands and desires for ecological services. So different people think uh, some things are important and others are not. That can lead to conflicts and lead to opportunities for trade-offs. So for example, wildlife and livestock conflicts. Uh, as one good example would be domestic sheep, which are important for provisioning food, but they also carry a disease which um, affects bighorn sheep and causes death them. So there's a conflict between food provisioning and, and um, wildlife species. Wind, wind turbines, most people don't like looking out over landscapes and seeing wind turbines. However, there could be some real win-win situations. For example, these cows don't seem to care what those wind turbines are doing up there. They walk under them, they graze under them, and that green grass that they graze might also have some other benefits. It might be capturing water and purifying it, certainly capturing carbon, adding organic matter to the soil. So there's a case where those three ecological services are certainly win-win situations. Another good example is ranching. There's a whole controversy that's called the ranching versus, or I'm sorry, the cows versus condos uh, argument. So maybe you'd rather have ranching than seeing land subdivided and turned into condos. Another good example is organizations like um, uh, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation or, or Pheasants Forever or Ducks Unlimited. Those organizations are all get most of their money from hunters, even though their goal is wildlife conservation. So those might seem like two conflicting ecological services, but they are quite complementary in those cases. The challenge as a range land, range land manager is that you need to manage all those more multiple ecosystem services and their interactions and demands for by multiple beneficiaries. So different people want different things, those resources interact, and there are many on one piece of land, and that's the job of the, of the rangeland manager. That's a very general overview of some of the values and resources on rangelands. Start thinking about what you value among those resources and what you think you could contribute, and we'll talk more about that.